Good afternoon. I'm Arthur Popper, and my colleague Tony Hawkins and I are very delighted to be able to present the keynote talk to you today. Tony is the gentleman in the picture with the hair, and he will be presenting a few of the slides that come on in the talk. This talk is going to consider the role of sound in the lives of fishes. Uh, we're also going to discuss the topic that Tony and I have been working on for the last 15 or so years, the effect of man-made or anthropogenic sound on fish. We're going to, to some degree, focus on gadded fishes. These are the cods and relatives, primarily because the Atlantic cod is really one of the most important fishes in the world commercially. There's also a good deal of data on bioacoustics of Atlantic cod and other cod other related species. And in a couple of papers that we've been publishing in JASA recently, we make the point that cod could actually serve as a model species for understanding, hearing, and also effects of noise on aquatic life. Uh, as a way of outline, we're gonna start out and talk a tad about how fish hearing evolved, how vertebrate hearing evolved. We'll then talk about the nature of underwater sound as a bit of a primer. We're gonna talk about sound production and acoustic communication by fishes, focusing on gadids. We'll talk about sound detection mechanisms, and we're going to digress here to talk about some ideas we have about how to determine fish hearing and what hearing really is. We'll, we'll then go on to discuss potential effects of anthropogenic sound on fishes. And here we're going to present a bit of data from two studies that we've done, one by myself and one by Tony. And then we'll talk about setting of guidelines and criteria, something that we've been engaged in very heavily over the last several years. Let's start out considering why did hearing evolve? Well, if you think about the most primitive fishes several hundred million years ago, the environment was probably living in murky water. The ability to detect signals around them that are of biological relevance was probably limited to the distance of touch or vision or whatever senses they had. But they, were, they really did not have any sense of the world, greater world around them. So Dick Fay and I proposed a number of years ago that the evolution of, of hearing provide, would provide fishes with a much greater per percept of the world, much greater area over which to detect signals. It basically enabled fishes, no matter what the environment was like, to detect predators and prey and to learn about their acoustic environment. Uh, so the fishes basically evolved hearing, not for communication, but for detection and use of what we call the acoustic scene. In effect, we, it, it allows fishes to be able to know the world around them at some distance from them. Uh, and ultimately, communication probably evolved, but that was not the primary source of sound detection. But a very important point to make that's relevant to the whole talk is that anything that interferes with sound detection and the use of the acoustic environment can affect the fitness and survival of fishes. They require this sound, virtually all species do, and so interference with detection has a potential impact on the animal. Just briefly, let's review underwater sound for those of you who don't think about this very often. If you want to get more, we recommend a website, docets.com, where they cover underwater acoustics in a very, very effective way. In air, we primarily think of sound pressure because particle motion, the second component of the sound, doesn't travel very far due to the low density of the air. However, in water, particle motion is very substantial and because of the density of the water. And so at substantial distance from the source, you still can have both pressure and particle motion. Significantly, fishes and invertebrate are primarily sensitive to particle motion. Pressure detection is a secondary, secondary evolution issue and not all fishes use sound pressure. Just think of sound, uh, sound pressure and particle motion as this sound here, starting from your left. The sound waves, which are sound pressure, travel at a distance from the source. They are a scalar quantity. They do not have direction. At the same time, the particles in the water move back and forth, staying in this about the same spot. But because they move back and forth in the direction of the sound source, they actually provide an opportunity to provide directional information to the animal. So it's very important that that's, uh, particle motion is the major component of hearing for fishes and invertebrates, and it can provide information 
about sound source direction. While we've always thought about particle motion and sound pressure when it comes to fishes, a new idea has recently started to perk up, and that is the fact that in water, there's also something we call substrate vibration. Not many people have considered this, particularly with regard to fishes, but it's something that we think that needs to be considered in the future, particularly when we're talking about things like pile driving or seismic air guns, where sound is projected into the substrate. As a consequence, the sound travels through the substrate. It can travel very fast, and ultimately it comes out of the substrate. And this can have an impact on animals at a substantial distance from the source. It also means that animals in the substrate, living on the substrate or just above the substrate, are not only getting direct stimulation from the source through the water, but also be getting stimulation from the substrate itself. And this can provide, be very, potentially be very significant. But as I say, we know very much about it. So many fishes use sound for behavior. Let's talk about that just a little bit. Over 800 species are known to make sounds. I suspect that in the future we'll find that many more species, including those living in the great depths, make sound and use of communication. The sounds are variable considerably. They're, they're knocks, they're grunts. They're produced in a variety of different ways. As I'll show you in a minute, and we'll play sounds for you, things like haddock, which are well, very well known, have a complex acoustic behavior that is involved with reproduction. And in fact, investigators have now learned that they can listen for the sounds of haddock and other species and find, uh, find animals that are in, in uh, breeding. Interestingly, many other species of fish do not make sounds. Something like the goldfish, while they hear very well, don't hear sounds, but we think that they, and they don't make sounds to communicate, but we think what they're doing is getting information about their acoustic environment. The previous sound you heard was that produced by a haddock, and they produce sounds using the swim bladder with a series of drumming muscles that are on the walls of the swim bladder. This is typical of a lot of species. The exact pattern of these muscles are variable between species and even within the, within the gathered fishes. In all cases, the muscles contract and produce the fundamental frequency of the sound, and the swim bladder serves as a way to amplify the sound and that sound is detectable by other species, other fishes in the, in the nearby area. This is an illustration showing you what some of the sounds look like from a, from a haddock. This is what a male solitary display would look like. And you can see that there are a series of pulses that are produced by the contraction of the swim bladder muscles. This, image, this figure shows the spawning behavior of a haddock there with a male, the smaller animal and the female, and they start out through a series of displays, the, and each, at each point in the display, a different sound is produced. So it starts out at the bottom of the slide, goes to the top of the male and female together, and once they start spawning, the sound is stopped. So let's now switch from sound production and communication and talk something about fish hearing and how, how fish detect sound. But first, before going into the, some of the data that we've accumulated, I want to digress because the issue of what hearing is and how to measure it is something that's quite open to discussion this stage at this point. Hearing is generally thought of as perception of sound by an animal and the ability to being able to behave or respond. In effect, it means that an animal has not only detected the sound, but it's been processed by the brain, uh, maybe, maybe signal, uh, various types of signal processing takes place, and the animal then responds. There have been two primary methods used to study fish hearing. The more classic method, first pioneered by Nobel Prize winner Carl von Frisch, was behavioral methodologies where fish are trained to respond to a sound when they detect it. The second measure, which is much more recently used, is based on, on what's known as ABR or AEP, which is a brain stem, stem response that measures the output of the, either the ear or the, or the brain during sound. The ABR or AEP method is recording at some point in the lower part of the auditory system, 
either the ear, the eighth nerve, or the brain stem. It doesn't allow for processing the signals by the brain or to, for the animal, may, the brain may actually extract signals in the presence of noise or determine things like sound source direction. Thus, ABRAP, while a very important tool, does not necessarily represent what the sounds the fish can hear, only what the ear can detect. As a consequence, what you can get is a sense of bandwidth, a sense of sensitivity, and it's a very useful technique when comparing between different animals that have been treated in some one way or the other for things like hearing loss. But you cannot from ABR, AP determine whether a fish can discriminate between sounds, whether it can detect signals in the presence of noise or a masker, whether it can determine sound source direction. In contrast, the behavioral approach to determining hearing is a mechanism whereby we actually ask the fish what it can hear. So it is how to use its whole brain to process the sound and then elicit a behavioral response. We've used a couple of different methodologies for training fish to do behavioral hearing studies. One of the early studies was shown in this figure developed by Bill Tavalga and Jerry Widinsky back in 1963, where they used a technique called a shuttle box where the fish was put in a tank with a barrier, the sound was turned on. After a few minutes, a few seconds rather, the sound, a shock was given and the fish would swim across the barrier and learned that when they went across the barrier, the sound would go off. So after a while, the fish would avoid the shock by going across the barrier as soon as the sound was turned on. We can also use classical conditioning pioneered by Tony and by Dick Fay, where we measure changes in heart rate when the animal hears a sound. And we condition the fish to change its heart rate whenever it hears a sound to again indicate that it is detected. In each case, the animal is trained to respond. It only responds when it can detect the sound. If it does not respond, then we know the sound is not detected. We combine that with a psychophysical method, such as that shown in the lower part of the figure, called a staircase method that was pioneered by Tavalga Wydinski for fish hearing, where the sound is successful, is presented to the fish, it's, it's lowered from after the animal's made a correct response until a point where it no longer shows a response. The sound was then raised until it detects the response, lowers, raised, and this threshold, which is defined as the detection 50% of the time, is in between the lowest sound level the fish can detect, not detect, and the lowest one it can detect. And this provides a true behavioral measure of hearing. With this methodology, we can study masking, discrimination, and a whole range of other, other. A second digression is a very important issue that we've been raising for a number of years now, is where one does studies of fish hearing. The bulk of the studies, including many, many of the studies that I've done, have been done in laboratory tanks. The problem is there are significant, significant issues as to the usefulness of those data because the sound field in tanks is extremely complex, generally much more complex than a fish would, would expect in the, in the open water. It's very hard in tanks to measure particle motion. It's in all different directions. It's again, unlike what happens in the wild. And so it's very, it's very hard to get good the particle motion thresholds, which are really the things that we're, we now know to be interested in because fishes detect particle motion and sometimes they detect pressure. It's, we have developed in my lab and Tony's lab and a few other places, tanks that are useful to act, that we can use to measure hearing, but these are often very big, very expensive and very difficult to have built. There's also the issue with tank studies in that is that the Differences in this data for the same fish species from different tank, different experimenters is very, very substantial. For example, Dick Fay first showed, and then he and Fritz Lodek showed it again. The, if you compare the data for goldfish from different laboratories uh, determined behaviorally, their differences are rather remarkable. And it means that we really don't know exactly what the goldfish can hear in terms of thresholds, particularly. And this is because the tank acoustics was so different from experiment to experiment. The conclusion you have to come to is the most effective way to get hearing data is in field studies, as something like shown in this figure that Tony, from work Tony and Hawkins did with colleagues in late in Loch Tauridin in Scotland, where the animal is in a deep water lake in Loch, the animal is in a cage, speakers are placed at different distances, 
some quite substantial from the, from the animal, and fish hearing can be measured in a, an acoustic environment that is very pristine, where there are no reflections, and where we can actually calibrate the sound field. So now let's talk about what fishes can hear. This figure shows several different points of considerable interest. First of all, the x-axis is frequency, the y-axis is the lowest sound level detectable, and it represents behavioral data from a variety of different species. The significant thing is to show the tremendous variability in sensitivity, that is the lower number that the fish can detect, and bandwidth. You can see there are some fish like the perch that don't hear very well, animals like the grunt and damselfish and squirrelfish hear a bit better, and goldfish and soldierfish hear quite well, up to three to 4,000 hertz. The significant things here are that, first of all, the European perch only detects particle motion. We, we suspect that the grunt and the damselfish and the squirrelfish detect particle motion and perhaps pressure, whereas the goldfish and soldierfish both have unique specializations in the auditory system that enhance their ability to detect sound pressure and broaden the bandwidth and increase sensitivity. What's also interesting is that the squirrelfish and soldierfish shown here both uh, animals uh, studied by my former student, Cheryl Coombs, when she was my graduate student. Cheryl is now retired, so you can determine how long ago that might have been. Those are species are sympatric species. They live very close to each other, sometimes in the same caves. They're closely related. And yet, if you look at the ear and the, and the connections to the swim bladder, they're very different in the two species. Both actually make similar sounds. So the hearing of fishes is very, very the best studies looking at sound pressure and particle motion were worked on by Tony Hawkins and his colleagues. And this slide shows some of those data work done in the field. In the case of the dab and the, and the salmon, we, both species that were uh, here only to low frequencies, they're only particle motion detecting fish. The cod is an animal that detects between, detects both sound pressure and particle motion. And the herring is a, a species that's adapted to hearing higher frequencies by having specialized structures in the ear that enhance hearing. Interestingly, some species related to herring in the same group, the members of the group Alocinae, uh, including American cod, can hear actually out to 100 kilohertz or more to detect uh, dolphin sounds and avoid being eaten. But these have high special degrees of specialization found in few other species. So now we know the fish is here, there's variability, and the question comes up is, how do fishes detect sound? Well, this is an image that was drawn by uh, Carl von Frisch back in the 30s. He, what he shows here is the head of a minnow, a European minnow, with the side of the head taken away. You can see the brain, and you can see in yellow the ear of the species, and you'll see that the ear is in the brain cavity, I will tell you there's no external ear in fishes, there's no middle ear, they're not needed. And some fishes have ancillary structures I'll show you talk about later that help them detect sound pressure, including this species. But this is a typical location of a fish ear. This is the drawing done by uh, Tony Hawkins from, a, from work done by Toradal, showing the ear of a of Atlantic cod. And you can see the brain, you can see the ear, the ear in fishes have three semicircular canals like we do. There are three otolith organs, the saccule, the utricle, and the lagina. And the ear is typical of most species of fish. The, the uh, otolith organs, which are involved in hearing, each have a dense calcareous otolith, which you can see in the picture, and a sensory epithelium, which they're, and they're next to one another. And the, as I'll show you in a minute, the hearing is related to the mo relative motion of the very dense otolith and the epithelium. Show you another picture. Here is here is an otolith lying near a swim near the sensory epithelium. You see the sensory hair cells and the eighth cranial nerve that projects to the brain. The each of the sensory hair cells has on its apical surface a ciliary bundle. And these ciliary bundles can be bent. And I'll show you that in a second. So this shows you the ear of a typical fish. The lower image shows you the whole sensory epithelium. It's shaped something like a sperm with the anterior end to the right. 
If you magnify that, you see the ciliary bundles on the sensory hair cells. These project up into the lumen, and the image on the right shows you a cross section to demonstrate this is a typical vertebrate hair cell. It's not very different from the sensory hair cells with which you're listening to this talk. This image is, shows you the otolith on the left and the sensory epithelium on the right. And the point we want to make is that they are connected by what's called an otolithic membrane. It's a gelatinous mass that we don't really know the structure of because it's very hard to work with, but it, can, it seems to connect the otolith to the epithelium. So when the relative motion takes place between them, the, the, um, the otolith cannot go too far. Let's talk a bit about how fish hear. The fish, as I said, fish are detected as a particle motion. The, as, as, the, as the sound comes along, the fish's body moves in, in phase with the water because it's the same density as water. The otolith being much denser lags behind the motion. And because they're connected by that otolith membrane I showed you a moment ago, the, the cilia are bent. This causes release of neurotransmitter and the animal detects the sound. As I'll show you in a minute, some species can also detect sound pressure by having the presence of an air bubble, which is in most cases a swim bladder, which re-radiates particle motion and stimulates a sensory epithelium. So there are several different pathways of sound to the ear that take advantage of pressure and particle motion. As shown in figure A, there are many fishes, including a lead lasombranchs, that have no air bubble, and those only detect particle motion in what we call the direct method of stimulation. The stimulation is that I showed you in the last slide with the sound pressure, the sound particle motion rather, stimulates the fish's body relative to the otolith, and you get stimulation of the ear. In some cases, the fishes have a swim bladder as at some distance from the, swim, from the fish, from the ear. This swim bladder detects pressure, re-radiates energy, but since there's a substantial distance between the swim bladder and the inner ear, the particle motion that's re-radiated uh, attenuates quickly and is not detectable by the ear. However, in some species like the cod and, uh, and the, and the, and the uh, soldier fish I showed you a little while ago, the swim bladder has anterior projections and it ends close to the ear. When it re-radiates sound, the sound, the particle motion is substantial enough that it too can stimulate the ear. As a result, the, these fishes, the ones that have a swim bladder near the ear or actually may have a bubble of air in the, in the ear itself, these animals detect sound pressure as well as particle motion. To show you what this means for a fish, look at this slide, it shows you frequency on the x-axis and the displacement amplitude that would stimulate the ear on the y-axis. Looking, focusing on the green line, if a fish just has a as a particle motion detector, the signal level decreases as this at higher frequencies. So it starts out at low frequencies, the displacement may stimulate the ear a lot, and the as it goes to higher frequencies, detection gets poorer. However, with the presence of swim bladder, there's this increase in particle in sound pressure, which increases particle motion, which effectively means that the bandwidth of particle motion getting to the ear is much higher, much wider rather. This increases the bandwidth and the sensitivity of the fish over a much wider range of frequencies. So the swim bladder actually brings, it allows the fish to detect particle motion at much higher frequencies. One of the most striking features about the auditories in fish system of fishes is the striking interspecific variability. And consider that there are 33,000 or more tilios, uh, bony fishes in the world the variability in the ear structure particularly is related to the overall ear shape and the shape of the otolith organs is rather dramatic. In fact, it's far greater variability than in any other vertebrate group. These differences include ear shape, configuration and shape of the otoliths, the shape and configuration of the sensory epithelium, the lengths of the cilia on the hair cells, and many other features of the ear. So this shows you a number of actually related species that work from by Xiao Hong Deng, showing you the tremendous variability in the shape of the ear and the and the, and the otoliths. This figure shows you the variability in the otoliths themselves from different species. What you can see is gigantic differences. We have very little understanding 
of what the shape differences mean. Uh, fisheries biologists use odorless to age fish. They put down rings every year, but why the shapes are there is something that we still ponder, although I think the general consensus is that it's involved in, in various aspects. So there are two fundamental questions about this variation. One is, what are, basically, what does the variation mean? Do, do the differences reflect ex, different methods of extracting information of the sound, that the fishes use different aspects of the sound for hearing and, and pay attention to different things? Or alternatively, are the different adaptations just different ways that have evolved the fishes of different, in different groups to extract the same kind of information? At this time, we have no answer to these questions, but, the critical, but this becomes one of the most fascinating and, and, and important questions in fish bioacoustic studies today. So in summary, what do we know about fish hearing? They detect particle motion, some detect pressure. Their ears are actually very similar to ours and hearing evolved in fishes, the ear evolved in fishes. The sensory hair cells are very similar to those in humans. And like other, vertebra other vertebrates, particularly mammals, Fishes detect a wide range of frequencies. They can discriminate between frequencies almost as well as we can. They can discriminate between intensities almost as well as we can. They can detect signals in the presence of other sounds, or other sounds are called masters, and they can determine the direction of sound sources. These are all characteristics in an auditory system that allows the animal to use the acoustic scene to, use, to understand its environment. But there are many open questions. The mechanics of the ear are things that fa fascinate many of us, and it's a very difficult problem to get at. Sound source localization, which the first studies were done by uh, von Frisch and Dycroft in the, in the 30s, is still an enig enigma for us. We still don't understand the mechanisms of discrimination and the comparative issues, the, the, the variation between different species is a fascinating project that, would, would, that really is open to study. So for the, as I've indicated already, Tony and I have been working on fish hearing for many decades, but over the last 15 or 20 years, we both got very involved and interested in the effect of anthropogenic sounds on fish. So I, for the remainder of the talk, we'll consider that as an issue. This is an image that was painted by the very great maritime artist Turner, uh, and it represents a massive change in ocean acoustics. That is, up till the early 1800s, the only sounds in the ocean were those naturally produced by fishes, by marine mammals, by geologic events. Starting in the early 1800s with the advent of steam, steam transportation, the amount of noise produced in the oceans and, the, and bodies of water by human activity increased dramatically. And this, has gone, and this picture shows one of the first steam engines towing a, one of the last sailing vessels. But this increase in sound in the ocean environment and the lakes and rivers has had a dramatic, potentially had a dramatic effect on marine animals. Why is sound, anthropogenic sound of such concern? Well, basically, we already demonstrated that sound is very important to aquatic life. Anything that impairs the detection of sounds can affect the fitness and survival of aquatic life. And thus, we have this growing concern about the potential effects. Now, the initial studies on the effect of sound were started with marine mammals, and this continues, of course, and it's a very important issue to consider. But more recently, the concern has spread to fishes and invertebrates. Clearly, they are major parts of the human and even marine mammal food chain, and anything can impact, that impacts this, the fish, fishing capabilities or the fish, survival of fishes can have a dramatic impact on humans. There's also concern about marine reptiles and birds, I think there's a talk at this meeting about the effect, potential effect on birds. There's considerable concern about the effect on turtles. This figure gives some sense of the types of potential effects and where they're located. And depend, it, this all depends on the received level of the sound and the sounds that the nature of the, each individual sound. Very close to a very loud sound source, fishes may be killed. This doesn't happen very often, and there have been very few experiments to confirm this a little bit up to greater distances. There may be physiological effects that I'll talk about later on. There may be temporary loss of hearing. At greater dis up to greater distance, there may be masking of sounds so fishes don't detect sound as well as they could. And at even greater up to greater distances, 
there may be various behavioral effects. So the potential effects can be, as I said, can be include masking. They can mask communication sounds or soundscape. They may cause hearing loss that's temporary. There's no evidence of permanent hearing loss in fishes. Fishes may be driven from feeding sites or spawning sites temporarily or permanently. They may affect, uh, sounds may affect fish um, migration routes. They may damage body tissues with the sounds are very intense. Very intense sound may affect may kill fish. In all cases, we can affect, may affect fitness of individuals and most importantly of populations. So there are many sources of anthropogenic sounds that can affect fish. This thing you just give some sense of them. There's pile driving, wind farms, and so forth. And I'll show you more of this in just a few seconds. <laughs> This figure demonstrates sounds from, fit, from, from shipping and boats. These have become much greater over the past decades, and there's no reason to think this won't continue increasing. Um, bodies of water like the Chesapeake Bay, which is near where I'm located, rivers where there's lots of shipping and the shipping's increasing. We can imagine that the background noise is growing tremendously also in shipping lanes, and this may be driving fishes from spawning grounds, or it may prevent hearing of uh, fish calls, and it's a, a constant sound. Pile driving sounds have become greater, as I'll show you in a few minutes, but mostly from things like marine construction, particularly of wind farms and, and harbors. Uh, pile driving not only produces sound in the water, but it also is produces sound in the substrate, which may get out of the water or affect animals living in the substrate. Uh, these sounds can are extremely loud, or can be depending on the pile being driven, they are probably as loud or as low as produced by the next thing I'll talk about, which is seismic air guns, and the sounds are impulsive. They bang, 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 and they can disrupt behavior and mask, do masking. Uh, but what's interesting about them is they don't necessarily be continuous. They may happen for a couple of days or weeks, and then they'll just, uh, pile driving sounds, as I said, are impulsive, and they are can be extremely loud. Uh, these sounds can be produced particularly in construction of offshore wind farms, and this is becoming a big issue in many parts of the world. There are two, part, two problems with wind farms. One is construction noise, which is produced by produces pile up driving, and the other, which we know much less about, is the operation of the wind farms, which, present, which continues to generate substrate vibrations and low levels of sound in the water, and there is concern that this may affect fishes and other animals. Interestingly enough, in many places where wind farms have been constructed, there's a massive attraction of fish that seem to like to use the wind farms and their, their structures as a way of places to live. So whether the sounds are bothering them or not, it still seems to attract lots of fishes to their locality. Seismic air guns are again a very large issue. and they are impulse sounds. I'm sorry, the sound didn't work. They are used for oil and gas exploration. The sounds are very loud. They produce not only sounds in the water, but they intentionally produce sound in the substrate, and that's necessary for the, the uh, exploration for oil and gas. These sounds go on for hours and days in the same area, potentially disrupting the behavior of the animals nearby. The next figure shows an actual experiment that Tony Hawkins was involved in, where they explored the uh, pelagic family, pelagic group of fish, whiting, which are related to the cod. They live in midwater, and they were observed during a from a during the experiment where the uh, uh, a boat was producing si uh, sounds on the size of a gear gun over a loudspeaker. What you can see is the school of hair, a school of uh, whiting with the darks on the left. They were at a certain depth, and the, as soon as the air gun went down, the fishes went considerably deeper and stayed there as, until after this air gun stopped going. So they were clearly disturbed by the sound of the air gun. Work in Norway over the last 20 years or so has shown 
that if you measure catch, fish catch uh, of a number of different species, as soon as the seismic study starts, the fishes leave the area or to go to great depth, only to return when the sound has gone off for, and have been off for several days. So while we have a good sense that anthropogenic sounds can have an impact on fishes, there are still questions about, many questions about all kinds of aspects of this. The trouble is there are very few data on the effects of sound on fishes. And there are a number of reasons for this. First of all, there's been very poor funding for work on, the, on this area. Most of the money on research in anthropogenic sounds has gone to studies of marine mammals. Much of the work has been done in the laboratory by various investigators. The trouble is, as Tony and I have shown in a number of cases now, data from the laboratory study on the effect of sound on fishes cannot easily be transferred to the field where the animals live. Because of the strangeness of the acoustic environment of a fish tank and the fact that the sound fields are not typical of, of animals in the wild, plus the fact that animals in cages or tanks tend to behave differently than they do in the wild, extrapolating from sounds in the, in the lab to the field is very difficult and highly problematic. The other part of it, though, is that it's very hard to do field work to observe potential effects. So while the data from labs are not applicable to the field necessarily, doing work in the field is very hard to do. And adding to that is just calibration of the sound fields in the field is, there, is also difficult, and determining the actual stimulus that affects fishes is difficult. So there are many issues that make doing studies on the effect of sound on fishes very hard. So what I want to do now is briefly talk about two projects, one that I conducted in my laboratory over several years, working with my postdocs, Michelle Halverson and Brandon Casper, and then we'll talk about briefly about a study that Tony has done recently that has been very revealing and a field study. My lab has been investigating the effect of pile driving on fishes, and we realized quickly that we could not do work in the field near a pile driver. It's dang they're dangerous, and you can't control a pile driving operation that costs tens of thousands of dollars for each pile being driven. So what we did was invented a way to bring a pile driving sound into the laboratory by developing a dev special device we called a hissy fit, uh, and in there we could produce sounds that were very similar to those produced during pile driving at the same levels, and then we could explore what effect, a potential effect these sounds could have on the on physiology and, and physical nature of the fishes. Uh, we were able to do a variety of different experiments to ask these questions. So our general approach was to place fish in a, this structure we call the hissy fit. It's a tank that has two very substantial speakers on either end. You see the open hissy fit here, We've closed, after the fish were placed in there, the, animal, the tank was closed and the sounds were generated. To give you a sense of how loud these sounds were, the hissy fit device was on the third floor of the steel building. And when we first did it, we didn't have enough vibration isolation. The, very, the whole building shook every time we played the sound. We quickly figured out a way to isolate it from the building. Otherwise we would have been kicked out. Uh, we've exposed fishes to sounds with varying numbers of strikes and sound levels. After the fish were exposed, we removed them. We examined the fish for barotrauma trauma or injuries, and uh, we used necropsy procedures, and then we held some fish for post exposure Just as a quick digression on sound, what we were concerned with was not the things that people normally are concerned with with sound, that's peak sound level or RMS sound level, but we're concerned with sound exposure level or the the total energy within each strike. So we dealt with what's called the sound exposure level or SEL for either a single strike, which is SELSS, or we can accumulated the sounds, which is the most important issue. How much sound is a fish exposed to over five, 10, 100 different impulses from a pile driving apparatus, which we call the cumulative SEL. So as I said, we exposed fish to either 960 or 1920 strikes. We varied the sound exposure levels, and we did studies in a variety of different species to look at the effect on body tissues and see how that would that change with different species. And just to show you what the injuries look like, we've had mild injuries, things like damage to the eye, a little bleeding in the eye or the fin. We had moderate injuries internally, which includes hemorrhaging of the liver, 
or bruising the swim bladder. And then we had what we call mortal injuries, which were internal hemorrhaging, damage to the swim bladder, damage to the kidney. Interestingly enough, the major damage we saw only came from the very loudest sounds and only occurred when the structures were near the swim bladder. You'll give you a sense of the kind of data we got. This shows you a graph of the number of injuries at different sound exposure levels. On the left, you find animals that were exposed to the lowest levels. They may have had just one or two injuries. As the sound exposure level uh, increased to the right, uh, uh, to the right, what we saw were many more types of injuries and many more of them in every individual fish. So what we were able to do is get some kind of uh, a, a graph, graph showing that as you increase the sound exposure level to which fish uh, encountered, the number of injuries occurred. Now, keep in mind, these were very loud sounds, extremely loud, and equivalent to fish being very close to the sound, so lived the sounds. So what we found in the, from our studies was that the onset of physiological effects in fishes, that is some kind of damage that may have been significant, occurred with a cumulative sound exposure level of 207 to 210 dB. It varied by species. Mortality does not occur until the sound exposure level is substantially higher, 215 dB cumulative sound exposure level. We found the effects are generally the same between species with very different morphologies, but there were distinct species differences. There was no effect, interestingly, in fishes that did not have a swim bladder supporting the hypothesis that the swim bladder motion during very intense impulsive sounds is what causes the damage. We did recovery studies and showed that the non-mortal injuries recovered in less than 10 days, but with a caveat on this is these were animals kept in the lab, they were fed, there were no predation. Animals in the wild with the same damage very likely would have been preyed upon and eaten and probably could not have fed. We had no ex injuries post-exposure, and as anyone would here would think about, would ask what, what happens to the ear, it turns out ear damage only took place at levels well above those that started to show other injuries. And our thinking is the ear in most species is not near the swim bladder, so damage does not occur. So a second study is done by Tony Hawkins with colleagues in late in a late in a loch in, in Scotland, in Ireland. And what he did was to put down a sound source and use an echo sounder to watch the behavior of fishes during stimulation from this sound source that was that was playing back pile dropping sounds. It's a, it's a great study because it was done in the field where many aspects of the signal were controlled and the recordings were controlled. And he looked at the effect of Sprat on Sprat and mackerel. And what we found, what he found in essence, is that both species during playback would change their behavior, particularly from in this experiment, Tony used a variety of different sound levels and the sounds were transmitted at different levels. They were able to determine which sound levels were caused at least half the population of groups of fish to respond. They found the sprouts were sensitive to sound pressure and more than 50% of the sprouts responded to sound pressure levels of 163 decibels. In the case of the mackerel, which don't have swim bladders and only are only sensitive to particle motion, about 50% of the schools respond to a particle velocity level of minus 80 dB. And this occurred when the sound pressure was at 163 dB. Uh, these sound levels often occur at several distances of several hundred meters from the actual pile driver. So pile driving can potentially affect fish over a wide area. But, and these are the first two species that have actually been examined in the field in response to equivalent pile driving sounds. Interestingly enough, in the same study, Tony observed zooplankton, which is the food of the two species, and he found they respond to the playbacks of the pilot driving sounds by moving deeper in the water. Uh, the zooplankton consisted mostly of copepods and crab larvae and other species eaten by the pelagic fishes, including sprats and mackerel. Uh, and so what happens is not only are we potentially affecting the, the uh, fishes, but also the food that they eat. As I indicated earlier, we know very little about the effect of anthropogenic sound. And this just gives you a list of some of the major research questions that need to be explored in the future, including effect on species, different species, uh, studies on uh, sensitivity of fish to different sounds, the need to focus on particle motion, effect of different types of anthropogenic sounds,
the effect of different types of sources, behavioral response to sounds of wild animals in the field, and things like the contributions of substrate vibra vibration to anthropogenic effects. They are, all of this work is involved with the issue of regulatory issues and the setting criteria when for use of anthropogenic sounds in the presence of fishes. The question really comes down to being, how do we set criteria that regulators can use that allows the effect, allows uh, studies and work using anthropogenic sound without harming the animals and without affecting the populations? It's critical in our view that any criteria must include behavioral and physiological effects, and they must include take into consideration variables as intensity of, uh, things like intensity of the signal, whether the sounds are continuous or impulsive, signal duration, and a variety of other issues. In other words, there is no one criteria for anything that can, affect, that can be used for all animals. The problem is the current criteria in the world, there are very few of them, were set are, are very much one criteria fits all. The best known criteria were developed by US agencies in 2008. They were not based on the best available sciences, nor have they been updated. However, in 2014, an international working group of which I, Tony and I were very much involved, develop interim criteria that are now being used, at least informally, in many parts of the world. And unlike the previous criteria developed in 2008 in the US, this takes into consideration different, type, different species groups, different sound sources, and different types of effects. And the work is based on the best available science at the time we did the work. Tony and I, along with Michelle Halverson, recently updated the literature and came to the conclusion that the criteria and guidelines we set in 2014 are still very relevant today. This just shows you what the, the criteria look like. Uh, as I say, it was developed for fishes. We also did work with turtles. Uh, they are still only in terms of sound pressure and not particle motion. They, we also need criteria for invertebrates, and ultimately we will need data on uh, criteria for substrate vibration and uh, its effect on animals. This just shows you what the criteria look like. I'm not going to go through this, but each of the criteria we set for different uh, different sources were based not only on the source type, but also on the different types of impairment, which is across the top, and the different animal groups down the bottom. And we set, based on the best science that were available at that time, uh, we set criteria that were inter considered to be interim, but at the same time, you'll see that many boxes are not filled in because there just then were not the data to provide the information that we need. Finally, let me just end by saying that uh, in conclusion, what we've shown you is fishes have the same basic hearing mechanisms and capabilities of other vertebrates, including mammals. Anthropogenic sounds is a very large issue around the world. Uh, far more research is needed in order to develop the best ways to protect fishes from anthropogenic sound. But it's very important to note, not all anthropogenic sound is bad. It's just, it's not good either but it's not bad. Keep in mind that humans and other animals function in a world with all kinds of sound around us, both natural sound and man-made sound. In general, most of these anthropogenic sounds around us don't bother us. The highways, uh, roadways in front of us, things of this sort, we adapt to these things, and it's very likely that fishes are not affected by many of the sounds. They ignore the sounds or habituate them. However, we need to understand this issue better and uh, much more research is needed. So this just gives you a number of our rel recent relevant papers that Tony and I worked on. Uh, you're welcome to email us if you want copies of these or the other papers we've done. And finally, permit me to mention that in 2022, we are going to have the fifth effective noise and aquatic life meeting uh, in Berlin, Germany. These meetings, uh, which have taken place every three years, have become the place to go for meeting with regulated scientists, industry, all interested in the effect of sound on aquatic life, and we'd be delighted if you would consider joining us. Thank you very much for your attention, and we appreciate being able to be here today. Such increased dramatically, and it has potentially has an impact on fitness and survival.